All right, you, you guys. Tell me the meeting's being recorded now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're going to be under oath, Travis. Oh. So, um, I'd like to introduce to everybody uh, my friend Travis Hansen, a uh, handsome fella and excellent illustrator. He has a, a long and varied career working in a variety of areas from graphic design to art director, small business owner, independent artist and publisher. Um, he's uh, worn a lot of different hats in his life, done a lot of different things in his career. And so I thought it'd be really good. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I thought it'd be really good to uh, pick his brain and have him discuss kind of uh, his business experience. And then also just the, you know, the ups and downs of being self-employed as an artist and a designer and just some of the things he's tried. Um, we've had discussions in the past about income streams and a variety of things. So I think it's always beneficial to hear from somebody who's, who's making it happen in the real world. So um, I'm going to turn the time over to Travis and let him get started. And then, like I said, I have some questions that I'll ask him to kind of prompt discussion. And then if you have questions, um, go ahead and throw them into the chat box and uh, we'll pick some good ones. And then at the end, I think I'll just open it up. and We'll have a free for all. So um, take it away, Travis. All right. Um... Well, my name is Travis, like uh, Patrick uh, stated. I've known Patrick for many, many years uh, through the different conventions and, and comics and, and such. And uh, I've been doing this professionally for over 25 years. And uh, it has definitely been the best job I've ever had, but the most hardest job I have ever had. Uh, and hopefully I won't be able, I, hopefully I'll, I won't have to change it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, let's keep it going. <laughs> We're going to keep it going. That's the goal. To, uh, I'm going to do something really quick. Uh, I'm going to share my screen with you, too, a little bit so you can see kind of some of the artwork that I do and, and get an idea. Uh, I am mainly, my, my main focus is I'm a children's illustrator and a fantasy illustrator. And... Uh, so I'm always creating new and, and different things. The other thing is, if you'll notice, uh, one of the uh, important things about my work is if you look through it, there is no uh, stuff that you would normally see uh, copycat artwork. There's no Star Wars. There's no um, Disney. I, I'm really a big proponent of doing your own work and why that is important. And I have found that if you want long-term success, then focus on your own IP. If you want a quick turnaround and maybe a quick, quick cash grab, but it's not a lasting job model, draw someone else's property. It's, it's one or the other. Um, it's okay to, you know, occasionally I'll draw a Wolverine because I like the character, but I'll never mass produce it. And that becomes a one of a kind original piece and it just allows people to, to see that I can do other things. But my main focus was, and it's always been create your own stuff, create the things that you wanted and not what other people tell you, uh, what they want. Um, so you can tell I like dinosaurs. I like kids. I like, uh, apocalyptic scenes with robots and uh, I am a huge proponent in my artwork of finding hope and, you know I, I'm a strong believer you can't control where you're born you can't control where you come from but you can definitely control uh, what you do with your situation and I always look for the positive this is one of my favorite uh, early pieces that, that kind of reminds me to always look for the good and you can find that in an art career uh, and, and right now, that's really important, right, Trev? <laughs> oh, it's one of the things that's kind of getting me through and a lot of other artists through is, is having that, that hope uh, of creating, going, okay, if I can get back to my community, I'm going to get back to my community. And you're going to find that the more that you give back, the more people, your fan base will, will they'll, they'll grab onto that and they will come back and support you. you. You won't find that you get abandoned by a fan base at all. Um, let's share another quick screen just to, to give you an idea 
Uh, my current project that I work on right now is a comic called Life of the Party. It's based on Dungeons and Dragons and role playing and fantasy. This is one of the programs that we use to do the illustration work, which I absolutely love and, and think that if you're going to, to do any kind of digital illustration, you need to get um, connected to these programs as well. So this is Clip Studio Paint uh, EX, and it's super cheap. It's like 75 bucks for the year. And, and it's, what you can do with it is, is I can draw, and you can't even tell the difference uh, than from traditional. It's, it's also extremely compatible with Photoshop. So um, it's so compatible with Adobe programs that once I do the illustration, I can go in and color it in Photoshop and it allows me to, to use all the programs together. So it's just a great way to do that. And these were, this is a freebie that we gave away um, actually today. It's a coloring page to allow people to just kind of de-stress a little bit. If you go to my, my Facebook page or find me there, you can just grab it and download it and just enjoy it. Um, practice coloring in, in Photoshop or just color on your own. Uh, like I said, so the, the goal was to, to create stuff to give back to people. And at the same time, you know, still work on what your clients give you. I do a lot of game work right now. I'm doing a lot for um, a lot of indie gamers, uh, working on a huge board game for uh, All About Goblins, uh, which I'm having a blast with. I uh, just finished another one uh, recently that's uh, kind of like a Scooby-Doo-ish set in the 90s and uh, working currently on a new monster manual that'll be with fifth edition. Uh, the other thing that's pretty neat or pretty awesome, there's, there's, you're not like stuck in one model. You can do a lot of different things these days. And I have found that, you know, utilizing Kickstarter and the crowdfunding programs, you can go way places that you could never have done 15 years ago. Uh, in fact, we've run, you know, I've run 11 Kickstarter, actually 12, now I think, and probably raised almost five hundred thousand uh, dollars through the through them all, and uh, it just allows me to create product to get out there for for not just clients but for other people. So Patrick mentioned a, a thing about streams. Let's let's look really quickly what what he's talking about, and you know if you're choosing to go the independent route or you know any route in graphics. Give me a second for a, a blank page. You know, you have to look at it that this is you, okay? You know, here you are, and you're just, you know, hanging out, woo -hoo. And you wanna be an artist or a creator or anything else or an independent person, and you, and you get there and you start drawing, and, and you realize, well, how do I make money? So. To, to survive, you know, a lot of people, they start drawing um, prints and then they sell the prints at conventions. Well, uh, forgive my spelling, I'm dyslexic. Well, the other thing is, is then start creating a book, sketchbooks. So all of a sudden, do you see what's happening? we're creating what's called multiple streams of income to you. Daily comic. Um, commissions. And sometimes these streams are huge. They're, they're thick and, and um, contract work. And it can, you know, it, it'll get bigger and bigger. And other times they wipe out. And what happens when one wipes out, and if that was your only source of income, you're kind of out of luck. But if you look at it here, we have several different streams still coming in. And sooner or later, this stream picks up again. And then you'll find another stream. So it's really, really important as an independent artist to look at how many multiple streams that you can get to come in and realize that you're gonna need them all if you're gonna survive. You can't just focus on one specific stream. So if you go, well, I only wanna draw comics, and that's the only thing you're drawing, when something like this happens and the entire market shuts down, 
you're out. But I've been lucky enough that I still have commissions and I still have contract work. Um, but I've lost a couple of streams right now just because of uh, conventions would be one, um, which is a huge stream. So we've lost this one. And, and the goal is, is, is I know this stream will come back, but right now I have to be prepared and be able to focus on other streams to bring in the income needed to cover uh, what's going on. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a great analogy. And would you mind leaving that up for a second, Travis? Yeah, let me get it back. Um, cause I think that applies to, you know, just about any business today, honestly, and especially in, in graphics, um, you know, I myself could take this analogy and say, as a, as a student or as a, somebody starting out in the industry, maybe one of my skills is Photoshop and I like doing, um, layout, but hey, somebody comes along and says, I need a website. And then I got to add that skill, web design or printing or any other um, avenue. I think that's just good advice under any circumstance is the more you can increase your skills, add value to your customers, add so, income streams, I think you're better off. So as, an, as a creator, you know, talking about that, that, that brings up an excellent point. What is your value? You know, and a lot of times we're not sure what our value is. Now, if you only know how to work with Photoshop, well, that's great, but you're pretty limited on what you're going to be allowed to do in the graphics industry. Um, you need to know InDesign. And you need to know Illustrator. And you need to know PrePress. You know, how does the ripping programs work? Um, you know, I learned how to make mugs. I got my own mug press. Uh, I understand. Uh, You're welcome. Uh, what? Oh, thank you very much for the help too on that. <laughs> but, I, but we ask lots of questions. So now I know exactly what I need to do. So by talking to you earlier and helping you between you and I figuring it out, it really allowed us to create um, this, you know, it, it adds one more thing to my value. I do t-shirts. Um, I can work with Clip Studio. I can do Procreate. I even know how to use Quark, and none of you probably know what Quark is, except for probably Patrick. <laughs> I, bet Rick, I bet Rick knows Quark. Rick knows Quark? <laughs> <laughs> Evil program. So if you only focus on one skill here, though, you're stuck. You know, you need to broaden out. Um, and what happens is, is, is if you're still here, you're in Photoshop, and this is the only skill that you know, your value might be 15 bucks an hour, if that. Minimum wage. So the minute you start adding this and 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 all these other programs and all these other skill sets, your value goes through the roof. And why do people call me right now? They know I'm in a meeting. All right, so your value goes through the roof and that's kind of what you want. You want your value to go through the roof. Um, so when someone comes and hires you, they're getting the full package. Uh, when I look for artists to work with me, which I do look, I, I'm looking for someone that can ink, that can pencil, that can color. So see how the skill set is, is growing? You know, I'm looking for someone that can do book layout, game layout, which is different almost. So we're building this incredible value system around you. And that's kind of what you want to do as an artist, because as an independent, you get, you know, if you go in and you go, well, I can only do InDesign and Photoshop and I've got minimal design skills. Well, your client base is about right here. But the minute you start adding these other buttons, your client base will grow as well as what you can demand financially. You know, your value changes. So instead of going, I can only, you know, my rate is 25 an hour. I can go my rate is 75 an hour because I have the skill set to back it up. Um, so when it comes to value, do you have to be working on a multiple things or once, or is it something where you're able to jump from one thing to the next one? Uh, it, it's actually both. I can jump from one thing to the next, 
Um, I work on several projects during the day. I try to do five or six different client projects during the day. And then I have my own projects in the morning, which I start. Um, as for the copyright question, which is a really good question, I just don't want to screw with copyrights anyways, um, especially because I own my own IP. I found out, you know, if you go through the proper channels, they get 30% of whatever you get, which is great. And the IP lawyers are now shutting down a lot of guys that are like screwing around with their, with their property. Disney, since it owns everything, is kind of going after everybody to some degree or not. Uh, and I had just found out I would rather be in control of my own property where I get everything back in return instead of having to pay someone else for something. Great. This is a really good start, Trav. Um, I really, really like that analogy and the drawing you did is really cool. So we should hang on to that. We need to make some screenshots <laughs> of that. Um, just uh, from your own experience, um, as you've you know worked through your career, how important has knowing printing and then also being involved in graphic design or art direction in your earlier career and then now where you are now, how has that evolved or what, what has been your experience? Well, I started out as a, a cartoonist for a print shop. Um, school was never an option for me, so I had to go in and learn everything backwards. Uh, so it's a different type of, type of schooling. It was all hands-on. And I had the opportunity at this print shop to go in and work not only in the design area, uh, but also I learned how to work on the presses. So I got a chance to see how the press worked, how when you put a four color image together, how to make sure that when it rips, it rips correctly so that the line screens are correct uh, and understand what the DPI actually meant and how important it was, how to register an image to make sure that your colors all lined up perfectly. Uh, we used something way back when they called it Ruby Red. It's uh, strippers used it, not the strippers that you might be thinking of today. Uh, these are these were guys that uh, they would strip out of the page and they would lay all this color and paper over it to make sure that certain things were masked out and not so that it would print correctly on the press. And uh, I can remember I got to spend some time, you know, watching how they worked on these little old AB dicks. And then they got, they had a two color Heidelberg press, which was pretty awesome. And they were running four color artwork on this Heidelberg, uh, on this little two color press. And it was coming out amazing. They had it really dialed in. So within about three years, I had, I had learned everything that I could in this shop. And uh, I learned from the owner who was, uh, he got his degree in design. So he took a bunch of us under his wing and mentored us and, and, and worked our way through it. And all of a sudden, I was his art director. So he was allowing me to go in and control a lot of what was going on. And, uh, and then I went in as an art director for another company for about 15 years uh, with a bike shop. And we took this small little rinky-dink online bike company and turned it into a $33 million a year powerhouse. And uh, then all of a sudden, um, you know, the, the hard thing is, is sometimes you outgrow a company faster than you want and uh, realize that uh, I needed to be on my own. And but having all that experience, I could bring to my clients and go, OK, when you give me a book file and you say, design this book for me, I just want pictures and I can go, well, not only can I design the book, I can also lay it out. And then I'll prep the files for you so they go to press. So no, they're no longer paying two other guys to do something. They have it all with one person. And it gives me a lot more control. Plus, if something's broken or fixed, well, if the press comes back and they say, well, this isn't printing right, they can actually contact me and we can troubleshoot it. Because the book might say that you can only, you know, it only works three ways. Well, that's actually a lie you get out there on the press and with the output and everything else, I can probably find seven or eight, nine, 10 ways that are different to, to fix problems. So I have found that, that knowing the back end actually increases my value uh, as a creator. At the same time, it allows me as I'm designing, I get to design exactly how I want because I know how it will output instead of just, a lot of creators and designers who've never, who don't understand the printing process, put themselves in a situation where they design something and it looks great on screen, but it's not functional for print. 
and and they well why it won't it work i designed it well the reason why it won't work is because you don't understand how the end process works and once you figure out the end process the whole game changes yeah exactly right just um knowing the beginning from the end really helps you out in the long run um so what motivated you to uh to go on your own and has that been an easy process <laughs> well we'll just say it was a joint motivation <laughs> <laughs> mutually agreed upon decision <laughs> well i mean i was working two jobs at the time uh my boss came in and uh he knew that that uh he knew where my strengths were and you know, I never had a bad review or anything. And he looks at me and he goes, you're not happy. I need you to go be happy. And, uh, he let me go to go be happy. And he was right. It was what I needed. Now. Yeah. I went through six or seven months of just maybe longer. If you ask my wife of like, Oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Like chaos. But at the same time, I already had a clientele base that was already built. So I wasn't going in blind. I, I already had clients that were looking forward for me to have free time because the minute people found out that I was free as an artist, um, the work just piled up and I've, I've worked ever since. I've never, never looked back. Now it's important to understand when you're working for yourself um, or as you get to that process to work for yourself that you have to do it all. So you need to advertise for yourself and social media is probably the best thing that could ever have happened for an artist. And you, the, the main thing that you have to look at when you're dealing with social media is how do I break away from um, all my politics and, and all my opinions and just focus on my art? Because you've got to realize that your audience is going to be from every aspect of life. So if you have, the right pain for you and the left pain for you and you offend the left, then you just lost half your income. You know, so I learned to keep, keep very quiet about what my own personal politics are. I just learned to just, they don't need to know that. Um, what they do need to know is that I draw. And so my goal is to constantly post art. Now I don't just stop with one social media platform. Uh, some people go, well, I hate Twitter. Yeah, I hate Twitter too. Twitter is just noise to me. But I use Twitter because uh, we found out in a Kickstarter, I got 60 to 70 backers from Twitter alone out of 1,600. So, and that's a lot. When you think of each backer as 20 to 25 bucks a piece, that builds up. So you learn to use each social media. Instagram's great. Um, Facebook is fantastic. Uh, you can also use, um, well, Snapchat's kind of hard, but, but start figuring out how to use the different platforms to your advantage. Use as many as you can. And the more that you can, the more people see your work. Second, post every day. You know, it could be something as simple as, um, let's go back. You know, it could be something as super simple as a sketch. You know, no one cares if it's finished or not. What they want to see is they want to see you working. And they like to be part of that whole analogy of, of working with you. So here's, you know, it's a simple sketch. It gives them a chance to see um, what's going on. And, and that's all they need to know. So, so when, we, when we do that, it just lets people know that I'm there every single day because this is also the profession that if you stop posting artwork, you're going to be forgotten very, very quickly. You constantly have to keep your game up. Uh, Life of the Party is a daily comic. So when I post Life of the Party, let's see, let me get back there real quick. Um, You know, every day there's a new comic. Every day something comes up for someone to see. Uh, I'm a little behind on this site. Uh, I've got about over a thousand now, but everything gets posted, you know, so that people know that I exist. It gives them a reason to come back. And uh, that's super, super important is to, is to create a reason for people to come back. 
Uh, the other thing is when you're working for yourself, you've got to realize that you need to create some sort of schedule. We're all now kind of in home lockdown. If you ever want to feel like federal prisons like, well, this is what federal prison feels like. You can walk around your own house and, uh, and not really go anywhere. But at the same time, this is your opportunity. You, have, you, you will never have an opportunity like this again to be this creative, uh, which is amazing. But you need to create some sort of routine. So for me, and my wife kind of rolls her eyes because she knows, you know, she likes to sleep in. But if I'm not up at 7 by 7.30 and I'm sitting at my desk, then I'm lazy. And what happens is, is, is I've got my routine set up. I get up. I, I get dressed. Yes, I could work in my underwear, but no one really wants to see that on screen. Uh, thank you for... Thank you yeah, for you're welcome. giving us that know. image. <laughs> <laughs> but you need to set some sort of routine. Get dressed, go, okay, for the first two hours, I'm going to draw or work just for me. I'm going to work on my project, my book, my design, school, whatever it might be. And then I go into client work. And I'll work from, from client work till about 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, have dinner, work for maybe another hour or two, and then go play and hang out and just finish the day off. So you need to create this routine of reliability. And my clients know that. They know that once I'm given a job, that I'll get it done. And they know that I'm not gonna slack off, um, I'm not gonna be lazy about it. And one of the other things that I had to ask myself as a creator was, I mean, I love video games. I like to play. I'm a huge fan of the old Final Fantasy games, which I still have on my PlayStation 1. Uh, <laughs> and if you're curious, it's Final Fantasy 9. So, um, but I decided a while back, I, I like reading comics, I like watching movies, I like playing games, but I'd rather be the guy that creates the comics, creates the movies, and creates the games. I, I find a lot more enjoyment with that than I would just sitting there going, all right, I'm going to play games for a couple hours. So it, it's just learning to re put your priorities in different, different areas. Now, the other thing, though, that you have to realize is, is whatever you charge for something, make sure it's worth your time. You know, a lot of people are going to say, hey, uh, I'm, I, do I get the friend deal, the, the friends and family deal? And uh, there is no friends and family deal. The only person that gets the friends and family deal is my wife, uh, my kids maybe, and my mom. So that's it. There, there, there's no family <laughs> plan because your friends are going to take advantage of you. And they're going to go, oh, oh, you know, hey, you draw. Well, that's your time. That's the money that you should be utilizing to put food on your table. Instead of, you know, you can barter. I barter all the time. Uh, I tell people, I had one friend say, hey, if you draw this, you know, that'd be awesome. I'd love it. And I said, well, I've got a floor that needs to be done. If you want to come work on my floor, I call that a fair trade. <laughs> nice. And some people have taken it up on it. Some people not so much. And so, you know, you have to, to set your boundaries. Put your, if you look at the site, you know, that's something else. Share screen, go back to the site. Under Hire Trav, I have all my pricing laid out. And I find it super important to put everything down in writing. Let people know what the deal is. So now when someone asks me a question, they go, hey, I would love to have a 13 by 19 big piece. I go, well, just go to my site, 13 by 19, it's $400 plus 20 bucks shipping. It's simple as that. It takes away a lot of the, um, the haggling because I don't want to haggle. Uh, it drives me absolutely nuts. So, you know, make it as plain as you can for the people that are going to do business with you. You know, that, that brings up some more uh, good questions, I think, Travis. Um, first would be, um, as a graphic designer or an artist, how do you decide what you charge, especially for someone starting out or maybe somebody that's been out for a while? How do you set your prices? And then maybe after that, if you want to talk about um, some of the ways that you can raise funds, like through Kickstarter or other things like that. So I would say... Um, look at what your bills are for the month and base your pricing a little above that. You know, if you know that you're going to have $4,000 in expenses, then you need to create $4,000 worth of artwork. So how much artwork can you do in one week that will get you a thousand bucks? 
and you have to, and that's a good way to look at it. You know, so if you look at it and you go, all right, I'm going to charge $50 a week or not $50 a week, $50 an hour or 25 an hour or whatever you feel that your value is, but always make your value high. You can come down a little bit, but, but just make your value solid. Um, when you look at that, you can sit there and go, okay, I need to do, to make a thousand dollars, then I need to at least do, if I'm charging a hundred bucks a piece, I got to do 10 pictures for a hundred bucks each. And that'll give me a thousand in a week. But do I have the clientele that can hold that? So, and that's the other thing is, is that's where you need to advertise to bring the clientele in. It, this is not something that happens like instantly. This is, you're looking at 25 years of building up a clientele base that it's like growing, uh, it's like being in a farm. Um, so you really want to, you're gonna cultivate, um, you're gonna, you're going to, to work at it, you're gonna, you're gonna struggle, you're gonna grow it, you're gonna grow it, you're gonna grow it, and finally, eventually, it really starts to flow, and then the work starts coming. So that's really important. You, you just got to realize that at the very beginning, you'll get clients sporadically. But as you become more reliable, um, it'll start to grow. And Patrick knows, and we talk about this often, and I think you can attest to this, my industry, if you screw something up, it gets around. People know uh, I, there's artists I won't work with. There's designers I won't work with. In fact, there's companies I stay totally clear from um, just because of reputation alone. So if you get a bad reputation, what happens, Patrick? <laughs> it follows you well around. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't go away. But if you're reliable and you're doing what you're supposed to and you honor your word, you'll always have work. And then people will want to work with you. And that's, that's a pretty neat thing. Now, we also live in a great day where you can just do it yourself. And if you look at it, Kickstarter has been one of the most incredible avenues for people to utilize. So if we go back up here, or Indiegogo, but I like Kickstarter better than Indiegogo, just personal preference. So let's um, see if this will even go. All right, so this was my last Kickstarter. We had 1,220 backers and we raised $61,000. Now this is kind of a lie because I had about $40,000 worth of expenses. So don't feel that, oh, wow, he raised 60 grand, that that's all the money. No, I had to pay quite a bit out uh, because what I'm raising money for was to build a product, not for me. I'm, I'm not here to make money. Uh, if I make extra, great. We made a little extra, so it was good for us. But it's important to realize that you got to separate that. You've got to go, okay, my Kickstarter is, is strictly to raise product to, to do a book. And so we created this this whole campaign for this one book. You know, we put the dimensions of the book so people could see it. They got to see the cover, pages that were inside, and we made it as graphically enjoyable as we could. We beat monsters down the way. Um, we had a whole group of different places where people could back. Um, and we found that, that this is an incredible business model to help you get to where you need to be. Um, if you choose you know, to go this route, my suggestion is very simple. Have a product in mind, whether it's a book, whatever you wanna do. Uh, know the costs, get, get all the costs down. Understand how much the project's gonna cost. Realize that Kickstarter and the bank are gonna take probably about 7% of whatever you make. So that gets taken off. So put that into your goal of what you want. The next thing, look at um, shipping. Uh, most of us ship from China. That's where I get most of my books. Uh, right now, uh, I just talked to my printer. I, I'm grateful I don't have a project coming over the water right now, but there's a two month delay that they're going through. So you've gotta be prepared for anything that, that comes up. I also do original artwork in these campaigns. I've got 16 pieces now that I've got to draw that I still have to finish. So, you know, there's so much that goes into it, but the reward is really awesome because now I've got 2000 extra books that I can sell at a convention. And not only 
so now I'm making more money with the product that we created. So it's, it's a great way. Now, it's the same thing in the art industry. If you don't deliver on your kick, you're dead because <laughs> it'll come back to you. you right. Know? You got to follow through on what you promise. Exactly with that one. And that one's a hard one to do. Mm -hmm. But it's well worth it. Great. Well, um, this has been uh, really good so far, Travis. I think you've, you've given out some really great information. Um, I do want to see if there are any audience questions at this point. Yeah, ask away. Um, feel free to type something in if anybody has a question they'd like to hear more from Travis. Um, while we are kind of gathering your thoughts, you guys, Travis, what, what advice would you give to someone who maybe in our uh, realm at RCC, maybe they're not interested in drawing right now, but they do want to be um, involved in graphics somehow. Where would you recommend they start to get either a job or to work on their own? Or what do you think? Both? You know, doing graphics is great. Um, if you want to work in a print shop or anything else, definitely look at um, getting a job, you know, Minuteman Press or some of these little print shops or whatever, get in, get involved in there, get in the industry. Don't take the job at McDonald's. Don't take the job at somewhere else. Get in the job at a print shop. Um, the other, you know, even if you're just doing bindery, you're still involved with what's going on. And that's super, super important. Uh, t-shirt companies, get a job at a t-shirt company. Anything that has to deal with the arts, you want to kind of to get involved in the industry a little bit about what it is. I mean, RCC has got a great printing program. You got a great instructor. I would definitely utilize the resource that you have there. So as you get those certificates and start moving out, you know, then you get into the industry and realize, oh man, I, I like working a press. You know, I've got a friend that, that's been on a press for 30 years and he loves it. He doesn't even want to change. He's, he just likes it. Even with the change in the ink, you know, I mean, that's what was my favorite part was the smell of ink. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you want to make sure that, that you've got things, um, you want to work in the industry, whatever it might be, you know, and the sky's the limit. You're not limited to working in a print shop. Um, you, I got a friend that was doing work for Disney right out of the bat, you know, and, and so you just want to just to, to go out. So we got two questions too. Yeah, uh, great. What, why do you prefer Clip over inking in Photoshop or Procreate? Uh, Clip Studio to me has a much more natural drawing feel than either Procreate or Photoshop. Clip Studio Paint, you can also hide anti-alias, uh, which you cannot do in Procreate. You actually have to modify a brush to make that happen. And that still doesn't come out clean. Um, and Photoshop, I just use for coloring now. I don't even use Photoshop for drawing. I find it to be unreliable. While Clip Studio, I have found to have such a fluid, incredible drawing ability that, man, that, that's just the way to go. Uh, how quickly do you need to finish drawings in order to make an income? What kind of practice have you done to improve the speed of your production? Well, you got to be quick um, to a degree. If it takes you 10 months to do, well, okay, let's, let's, let's break that down. If it takes you one month, to do one illustration and you charge $300 and you spent 30 hours on that illustration and do the math. Uh, most of the pieces that I work on will probably take me about six hours. If uh, my comics an hour at the most, hour and a half. So you need to, to be quick, sketch every day. Uh, I draw all day long. Uh, I'm constantly trying to, to improve my speed. And as you get older, you slow down. Uh, I mean, I used to, uh, I do free sketches at conventions, and Patrick knows this. And we figured I've done about thirty-five thousand sketches in fifteen years, if not. You've more. been working a long time, old man. I sure have. <laughs> sure. But uh, <laughs> but at the same time, I'm not as fast as I used to be, but I still try to keep my speed up. Um, so, what kind of practice? I I just doodle. I I doodle all the time. What do you do when you get stuck on an? Uh, artwork. I go to another art piece. <laughs> I, I, I change gears. Uh, it's okay to put a piece down for a bit. There, there's nothing wrong with it. If there's a deadline that it's due and I procrastinated and I waited till the end, well, then I got to push through it. Uh, and sometimes that's all you have to do is push through it. You can't really just, um, you know, you can't walk away. But there's other times that I, I walk away 
and I'll come back in an hour or two, uh, uh, you know, refreshed. Uh, I'll go look at something. I'll go watch a Malazaki movie. Um, I just, I, I go look for inspiration. I might even troll uh, uh, um, Instagram for ideas. You know, it's anything that I can get my mind back into the game. Um, what's the most difficult part about being a freelance artist? Knowing when the next job's gonna come. You never know when the next job is. Uh, how long do you estimate it would take to develop a client base if you've not worked for someone else first and need to develop one? It, that depends on you, actually. Um, you know, I'm looking at 25 years and most of my clients I'm meeting for the first time uh, in the last couple of years. I've been posting art though for 25 years. Uh, I, I post every day and, and I've realized the more that I can get something in someone's mind, you never know who's looking at your art. Um, you got to understand looking at, you, you find people, art directors are trolling these sites all the time looking for artists. Uh, and I was amazed. I had a call from Blizzard once looking for if I wanted to work on a project with them. And uh, it didn't work out and that's okay, but they found me online. So there's really, how much are you willing to put into it? will probably determine how quickly you build a fan base and build a clientele. What are the copyright issues when it comes to selling fan art? Basically, they can shut you down if they want completely and make you pay back. You got to look at that realistically. Um, Disney won't touch you until you start making money. Uh, think about all the little baby Yodas. You know, they, they were like fine. And then all of a sudden people were making so much money on, on Etsy. And, and all of a sudden Disney was sending out cease and desist. They were like, you're done. No more. We're, we're, we're through. So um it really my deal is stay away from it it's not worth it in the long run because you spend your whole career chasing somebody else's dream you're chasing someone else's artwork you're chasing whatever's the next hottest thing or you think the hottest thing is so all this energy that you could have put towards you you're putting for a quick cash grab at the moment well that cash grab is going to dry up sooner or later so what you need to do is kind of figure out how much but how am i going to survive long term and that's where I really focus on building your own, your own world, your own creations, your own style, your own books. Make yourself you, you know, make yourself the IP. Then you don't have copyright issues. You're, you're in a lot more better control of your career and you get to control a lot of the shots. Uh, you mentioned you were involved in indie game projects, correct? Yep. If you have an intellectual property or an idea that you want to make out of a game, how would you make a team to make sure that reaches its goals? Well, Brandon, you actually need to find out. The hardest thing is, is finding someone that is married to your idea. We all have our own ideas. And we, um, that's a frustrating thing is, is bringing someone else into the party that's not married to your idea. I, I actually prefer to work on my own projects alone. I don't usually bring people in, but not everybody is an artist. Um, and when I'm working for other artists, it allows them to, uh, they pay for the service. So now I'm married because I'm being paid to draw their book or their game or their project. And that's the same for you. That's how you build your team. You need to be willing to, to pay for the talent that you're gonna have design your game and you have to figure out how to make that happen. And that's gonna be a tough one. That's why I say Kickstarters or put some money away or something, you know, just get some concept art done. And then you can get other people to finance it or back it. But honestly, finding the right team, that's a tough one because you, you, you're gonna have, you know, you wanna do it with your best friend, but your best friend might not be willing to put everything in it. And if you put a team together, make sure you have a good contract that it's all out in writing. You know, so everybody knows what they're getting, how it works. And if they don't do their part of the job, what happens to them? So um, as for reaching its goal, that's all about individual drive. You're going to have someone that needs to push that, that project, whatever it might be, to get it done. And, and if it's not you, um, I hope you find someone that, that it is going to be able to push that, that project. But in reality, since it's your baby and your dream, you need to, to push it. 
Uh, you talked about transitioning from a graphic artist job into freelancing. What's the biggest advice do you have someone who wants to transition from freelancing into having a career in the industry or job at a major company? Do you find that easier from one to another? Does it depend on how big your client base is to have? No, it doesn't depend on companies. It's just how big your client base is either. It just depends on what you're willing to do. If you want to work for someone else, then you have to submit like everybody else. You got to go through the, the same process. Um, big companies, you just got to understand if you want to work for Disney or uh, Warner Brothers or everything else, that's a freelance job. Disney does not hire permanent artists. They hire freelancers and they work for the show. And once the show is done, you're done. And then you have to go through the process all over again. So my buddy that was a, a storyboarder for DuckTales ran into that same problem. You know, he worked on The Simpsons for 21 years. All of a sudden, Simpsons were done in the project that he was working on. So he went over to Disney, works for Disney, worked for them for three years. Now that that project's done, he's now looking for another job. Uh, we, Patrick and I have a mutual friend for DreamWorks. He's in the same boat. Every two or three years, he's looking for a new job to transition to in, with these big companies. So it's, it's the same thing either way. You're still going to be having to push yourself. Um, you can get an agent, but then you give that agent 30%. Were you always good as an illustrator or did you learn? Uh, I learned. I think every, I think we only have 5% talent in us and it's 95% drive. Um, so it's all about drive. How bad do you want it? And you can't tell me how bad you want it. I don't believe you. You have to show me because uh, talk is cheap. Uh, do you use any traditional advertising for promoting your work or Kickstarter projects, or is it simple social media mouth of word? So because I do a daily comic, I didn't have to, I spent maybe $50 on advertising and it advertised itself. It was great. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. Uh, other books. Yeah, I've had to, to, to do that. I find that word of mouth and social media is a really good way, but you just have to do it smart. Stay away from, you know, spending lots of money. You don't have to spend a lot of money to do it right. And be careful about every, every everybody's going to come out going, yeah, we can help you advertise. We can help you advertise. Just give us a portion. And I never liked that. Um, I just figured I'd do it myself. Why did I choose to focus my art on D&D? Uh, did you have other inspirations as well? Well, I grew up playing role-playing games. Uh, I can remember the Red Box from the 80s. I started playing when I was 12. Uh, I've loved comics. I love fantasy. I got an Eisner nomination for a fantasy comic that I drew. Um, so it was just a natural fit for me to just play in my own little imagination and fantasy and stuff like that. And being a dad of five kids, it kind of allows me to just go, hey, I can work off their imagination too. And all of a sudden we gelled. We had this, this, this really sweet co connection. How many hours and days? Uh, a week would you say that you spend on social promoting on social media? Uh, probably about an hour a, a day about, you know, I'm always, I don't watch my social media as much right now uh, just because all my friends are all doom and gloom. A bunch of creators. I'm like, guys, it's all right. We're going to get through this. So I, I try to post positive things and then I kind of turn it off. Uh, <laughs> but I'm still posting daily and I'm still utilizing it. So the first 15 to 20 minutes of my day is all social media. And then throughout the day, I'll check in. I'll do an, a, usually an evening post, but I limit it. If you spend the whole day spamming your Facebook, uh, you get shut down in their algorithm really quickly, but you can get away with about three good solid posts a day and be okay. Do I still play D&D? &D? If so, can I join you? I don't get to play much anymore because I'm doing a lot of work for them. Um, so I, I, if I was playing at the moment, yeah, you could hang out with us and play, but right now we're, we're just not playing at the moment. Uh, when you say promoting on social media, does that include comics or are you replying to fans and et cetera? Everything. Promoting on social media is any interaction that you have, positive or negative. So, you know, we talk about promotion and we have to be really careful with that word because when you're on social media, you are promoting you and you are passing on an image to somebody else. And that could be a positive image 
that people will gravitate to you and gravitate to your works, or it could be a negative image where they shut you down. They don't want to listen to you or they'll turn you off or whatever. Uh, we spend a lot of time uh, venting on social media and a lot of people turn that off. Uh, so if you switch your, your mode a little bit and do ways to promote and to build up things, then, then things start to happen. You, you've got to create hope. And it's pretty awesome when people recognize that. I think, I think that's a, a good place to pause, Travis. I think that's a really good message to get out there right now, especially is to be, to be positive and to share good things because I think that does uh, attract attention. Uh, it's easy to be negative, I like to say. You know, it's, it's a little bit more work to be positive. But especially considering our circumstances right now, I think that's really good advice. Um, so we're almost on an, on an hour here, so I don't want to use up all your afternoon. Um, but uh, what I was thinking is um, I'm going to go ahead and end our recording and, uh, and go ahead and set that part aside. And then 